Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on our foundation level sample paper discussions. We are talking about the set C of our official sample papers and continuing ahead with the chapter 5. And we have discussed a few questions earlier in our previous session and this time we are covering another few questions from the chapter 5. And the very next question we are looking at is the question number 33 which is talking about the level of risk. Now, which of the following are two factors that can be used to determine the level of risk? I think by now we should have recalled after the two sample papers and quickly talking about some straightforward questions. Uh, we do understand the determination of level of risk is done by two major factors. That is impact, which is severity and the likelihood, which is the frequency or probability of that event to happen right and that's the straightforward determination it's a combination of two parameters that is impact and likelihood measured together to define the level of risk and that's where the very straightforward answer to this particular question is d likelihood and impact which determines the level of risk Let's jump into the next question which is a little slightly complicated question where we'd be interested to explore some a moment and try to understand what could be best way to tackle such questions and come to a conclusion. Number 34. You are working as a project manager on an in-house banking software project. Again, don't be confused that are we really talking about a project manager at the foundation level examination? No, not at all. You're not talking about calling you as a project manager, looking forward to the experience of the project manager. It's just a typical scenario. Because generally these decisions, what we are going to talk about, is made by the test manager or project manager. All right, but the concept remains the same what you covered in the syllabus, right? So to prevent the revoke and ex excessive fixed, uh, find fix retest cycles, the following process has been put in place for resolving a defect once it is found in the test lab. Now, what are the options? We got A, B, C, D, E as different uh, you know, scenarios preventing the rework and excessive find fix retest cycles. So the assigned developer A, the assigned developer finds and fixes the defect, then creates an experimental build. B, a peer developer reviews, a peer developer review, unit test and confirmation test the defect uh, fix on his or her desktop. A tester, usually the one who found the defect, Confirmation test the defect fix in the development environment. Once a day, a new release with all confirmed defect fixes included is installed in the test environment. And E, the same tester from the step 3 confirmation tests the defect fix in the test environment. Now, nevertheless, a large number of defects which the testers confirmed as fixed in the development environment, that is in step 3, are somehow failing confirmation testing in the test environment, with the resulting rework and cycle time outcomes. You have the highest confidence in your testers and have ruled out mistakes or omissions in the step 3. Now, which of the following is the most likely part of the process to check next? Now, if you find a flaw, here we are clearly saying that we have found a flaw in the step 3, right? Usually the one who found the defect confirmation tests the defect in the development environment. So you have the highest confidence and have ruled out mistakes or omissions in the step 3. Now, what is that uh, you think uh, is the most likely part of the process to check next? Now, here we need to understand few things very pretty much uh, you know, in detail that when it comes to certain scenarios uh, like what we are planning to put up the process in order to improvise ourselves, what could be our loopholes, right? And here we have got five options which we have defined and uh, we, we did understand that to a certain extent. We tried doing the confirmation test, right, which was failing uh, in the test environment, right? So what is that we can do? to avoid best. So you need to review all the five points here once again and then look into what is the best thing. So let's see the first option here, option A. It says testing and development, right? Testing and development is the area which you should be looking forward to is actually not correct. Because if inadequate developer testing were the problem, 
the confirmation test would not pass in the step 3 because the confirmation test initially passed when you migrated the code to the different environment that's where things are failing right so you really can't do that or waste your time targeting the testing and development because developer testing was done confirmation testing was performed and it was working fine coming to the option b we have dynamic and reactive approach right and here the testers who successfully perform the confirmation test in step three is repeating it in the step five so we really don't have to do that so there's a dynamic testing happening there's a reactive approach because there was a confirmation testing and as an outcome of that you are again rerunning the same test in the next environment to confirm that if here also the defect is actually resolved and there are no open issues so that also is not likely the option Coming to the C, it says statement and decisions. Now, that's something interesting to discuss. Configuration management maintains the integrity of the software. If a test that passed in the step three fails in the step five, then something is different between those two steps. Now, one possible difference is the test object, the option listed here, and another possible difference is the between the development environment and the test environment, which is very straightforward, right? The development environment, you confirm the fix, now you deploy it to the test environment. So what exactly the step five? The same tester from the step three confirms test in the test environment. So the moment the deployment happened, there is some component issues which were deployed from one environment to another. So probably the deployment did not go successfully, or if the deployment was successful, not the right set of components were deployed. So right? Now here, the concern is to check that could be a possibility that it was not tested efficiently. You're talking about the every statement, every node, every decision being migrated, right? Or being pushed to the next environment. So there's something which you're missing in terms of the component, which looks more likely to be the next thing to check on. And D, likelihood and impact. I think this is more about fixing a defect and has nothing to do with the release, right? Again, if you talk about the risk analysis on this, uh, developers are not, we're not fixing the defects. The confirmation testing would not pass in the step three again, right? So if the te confirmation testing passes in this step three, all the other options can be very well ruled out, right? And the only thing which we need to take care of, like what could go wrong when we migrate components from one environment to another environment, and there could be a possibility of, uh, you know, failures happening due to the partial deployment or components or nodes or decisions being missed out while doing the same. But just tell, let me tell you something. This is a very unique type of question, which certainly requires great understanding in terms of CI, terms of agile, the deployment part, and et cetera, et cetera. So I would suggest that these type of questions may not appear in the examination because this is more of like, again, one of those typical agile questions where you have covered what is CI, CD, what is a pipeline, and what exactly happens when you deploy things from one environment to another environment. So this is something which is not a typical, but the question was from the point of what would you observe next? And again, being a project manager, yes, not being a tester. Tester does not you know, look into these kind of flaws. But yes, being a senior tester, you can always do that. Right? So giving you the right answer here, the right answer here is C, statement and decisions are the next set of items to be checked to improvise the process as we are failing at the step five. All right, looking at the next question here, that is question number 35. You are engaged in planning a test effort for a new mobile banking application. As part of the estimation, you first meet the proposed testers and others on the project. The team is well coordinated and has already worked on similar projects. To verify the resulting estimate, you then refer to some industry averages for the testing effort and cost on similar projects, published by a reputable consultant. Now, which statements accurately describes your estimation approach? So, we covered a very high level understanding on the test estimation because generally this is also a test manager responsibility, but you did cover about the two different approaches, that is expert-based approach and matrix-based approach. But here they're trying to ask you that, okay, how exactly will this be applicable, 
right? And that's what we want to check here, that which statement accurately describes your estimation approach here, where you're trying to first uh, discuss with the team and then look at some uh, parameters, some calculations, some averages, which are provided by your consultant. So sequence is defined here, right? So all you need to judge here is, what is expert-based testing, how it is defined as, and what is a matrix-based testing and what it is defined as, right? So let's look at the option. Option A says, a simultaneous expert-based and matrix-based approach. Now, very straightforward now, because you're not doing this simultaneously together. First, you do the first iteration where you talk to the people, you meet the people, get their in, you know, in intuitions, and try to uh, come up with your calculations, and then, you get into the second part of it, which is to look at the industry averages from the consultant. So it's not a simultaneous activity of expert-based and matrix-based. Moreover, expert-based is where you discuss with the people, matrix are calculation-based. So A is incorrect. B, primarily an expert-based approach, argumented with a matrix-based approach. Yeah, looks appropriately correct as per the scenario. You start with the expert-based approach, which is your foundation, and then on top of it, you get some calculations, which are matrix-based approach. C, primary is matrix and augmented as an expert-based approach. No, it's just getting vice versa as per the given scenario. And coming to D, primarily planning poker checked by velocity from the burn down charts. Now that's an incredible option. We really don't know if this project is following agile methods anywhere or how exactly the burn down charts can be populated at the estimation level, right? And that to like a consultant, external consultant, do not know what the burn down charts are because that's internal to the project members, right? So keeping it short and simple to the point, the right answer here is B, Primarily an expert-based approach augmented with a matrix-based approach because first you talk to the team members, that is expert-based, and then you talk or pick up the matrices calculations from the industry averages with help of a consultant. Now that makes it clear what exactly we're looking for. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the tutorial team. Happy learning.